Hallelujah. Man, I really, really appreciate you being with us here tonight for worship and for prayer and for Bible study. It's just always wonderful when we can gather together, even through this means, and lift up our voices to God. Amen. Well, tonight I am going to try to wrap up this uh, fire Bible article that I have been kind of trapped in for the past couple of weeks because I just can't get seem to get through all my notes. But we are in the article that's talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I told you in week one, we're going to barely scratch the surface. And, and I hope that you're taking out your fire Bible and reading that article because it is literally filled with so much great truth that literally has the power to transform our lives. So two weeks ago, I talked about uh, my experience of becoming a follower of Jesus Christ and then kind of later on learning about this second experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that God wants us to have. And, and so we've been talking about the biblical truths and, and talking a little bit about some of the misunderstandings about uh, this experience that God wants us to have. And so I want us to do a quick review. And then I want to talk to us about uh, what do we need to do then to prepare our hearts to receive what God has for us in his gift. And what we need to do, how, how does it kind of work? And what are some of the mechanics when it comes to being filled with the Holy Spirit? And so let's go back to Acts chapter 1, starting in verse number 8. And this is that moment in time when Jesus is getting ready to ascend back into heaven. And he's giving his followers his final instructions. And he says, you will receive power. You'll receive power. This is not just about another religious experience. It is about power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Again, this is not power simply to help us have a great feeling or a religious experience. It is a power with purpose, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea. That kind of represented their, uh, their comfort zone, where they were from and their people, but also into Samaria. That represents a cross-cultural witness that they are to go out and, and share this good news with people that are not like them. And then to the ends of the earth. That means that God wants to touch everyone in the whole world. The mission of God from the book of Genesis right through the book of Revelation is that God would reach out to everyone in the whole world with his plan of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so he said, so Jesus said, before he ascended back into heaven, wait for this power and then you're going to be my witnesses. And so they waited. They waited for about 10 days after the ascension of Christ. And then in Acts chapter 2, we pick up the story as, as they waited and as God began to send his Holy Spirit. So let's look in Acts chapter 2, starting with verse number 1. So the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost came, this, this Jewish festival of Pentecost, when that day arrived, they were all together in one place. The Bible tells us that upper room. And then suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. And uh, just imagine as they were uh, sitting there praying and waiting, this sound fills the room and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 3 says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. So now the sound, now the, the, the vision of this, what appears to be fire, and it separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them that were gathered there sitting in that upper room. And then in verse 4, this scripture culminates in this thought. It says, and all of them, you know, if you're at home, say all of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had this experience, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, enabled them. Amen. And this incredible experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, began to happen over and over and over again in the apostles' lives and then in the lives of people uh, in that first century as they put their faith in Christ and as they pray to receive this experience. And then throughout the century, since that first century, right up to this day and age, to this time that we are living in, God is still saving people through Jesus Christ. Christ, and he's still 
filling them with his Holy Spirit, giving them this experience that we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But again, the author of our, of our article, and I also want to join with him in making an effort to remind us that this, uh, this experience has a purpose. And it's not just so that we can get goosebumps at church or have, you know, a religious encounter or religious epiphany, but it's a experience with purpose. We might say that the primary purpose of this experience is to have a personal confidence or boldness uh, and an empowerment. That Not that we're just bold, but that we also have a power uh, to achieve God's purposes. God wants us to be those witnesses in the whole world. And, and so he needs to help us to have a boldness and a power to achieve those purposes. Uh, but those purposes are going to be in us as believers. He wants to do some things in us. And then God's mission in the world. God has a purpose for, for this power. And what he wants to do in us is, uh, is primary to what he wants to do through us, which will happen as a natural result of having this boldness and power. The author says in the article, he says, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is as relevant now as it was in the early church. I know that there are some people who would want us to believe that this experience was only necessary for that first century church, but our article writer, and I want to echo his sentiment, reminds us that it's, it's relevant right now, uh, right here in 2020, in your life, in my life, throughout the world. It's relevant. It's, it's as relevant now as it was in the early church because, why do we say this? Because... Christians today, you and me, need the same power and guidance to live for Christ and accomplish His purposes. I think it is just crazy for us to think that we can do uh, what God is asking us to do without His help, His, His power leading us and guiding us and emboldening us and empowering us to do His will. If the first century Christians needed this experience, then the 21st century Christians need this exact same experience if we hope to accomplish God's purposes in the world. And so uh, we talk then about these biblical truths, and I'm not going to take time to reiterate it. Let me just summarize just three of the thoughts real quickly to lead us into our talk tonight. But first, we said that being baptized in the Holy Spirit is a gift and a promise. It's something God wants you to have. It's something that Jesus promised we would have. Secondly, we said that being baptized in the Holy Spirit is a distinct and separate experience from spiritual birth. That, that first you need to be born again and have that spiritual experience, but then, whether it happens immediately or in some time after that, we need to have a second experience of being baptized in the power of God that we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then the third biblical truth that we talked about is this idea that, that the initial physical evidence or the initial physical sign of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, as we see it in the book of Acts, is speaking in tongues. This is, for whatever reason, this place where a lot of Christians just get tripped up in this idea that speaking in tongues is a part of this experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and I really don't think it's reasonable to get wigged out about this idea of speaking in tongues, because if you'll think about it with me, everything in our entire Christian belief system is a supernatural belief. And so why shouldn't we believe in a supernatural occurrence called speaking in tongues. I mean, come on, think about it. We believe uh, in an, an invisible God who out of nothing created everything, all the world and all the universe and all that we see just by the power of his spoken word. Then we believe that in this world that God created humans to be like him in his image, but because of our sin and our failures, he had to come up with another plan. So he miraculously and supernaturally uh, impregnated a woman named Mary through the Holy Spirit and, and birthed a perfect man, Jesus, to work God's plan. This Jesus that we believe in, the Bible tells us that he performed these signs and these miracles. He even walked on water and, and multiplied loaves and fishes miraculously, supernaturally, uh, even raising a person from the dead. I mean, come on. It's supernatural, but it doesn't stop there. We also believe that Jesus himself died 
on a cross. And then when he died on that cross, that somehow in that moment of dying on that cross, he took all of our sins, your sins, my sins, and all the sins of people throughout the history of, of the planet earth that have ever lived. And he took those sins upon himself so that we could be forgiven. But, but then that's not the end of our belief. We believe that this Jesus who died on that cross, then he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And then after three days, he rose from the dead. He got up from the dead, supernaturally rising from the dead so that we could know that we are justified before God. But then it doesn't stop there. We believe that Jesus then, after instructing his disciples, ascended into heaven and one day will come again. And, and, and you and I, we have now put our faith in this supernatural act of Jesus so, in, in a hope that one day when we die, that we won't just be dead, but that we will also be raised to life with Jesus and go to live with Jesus in a heaven forever. I mean, everything we believe about God is supernatural and, and, and really it's, it's beyond anything in the natural. And then we're going to get hung up on tongues. You know, it just doesn't make any sense that we would get hung up on this idea. But I think for a lot of us, we have been more taught by uh, uh, man-made religion than by the Bible. But if we would just take a look at what the Bible tells us about the experiences that Christians should expect and believe and receive, man, we could really experience all that God has for us. And I, I want us to have this experience. I want you to have this experience. I want to have this experience experience it new and afresh as often as I can have this experience because it is an absolutely life transforming experience, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so tonight, let's move into tonight's teaching that really talks about preparing your heart then to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, so we have been studying this and we have been looking at the scriptures and we've been listening to testimonies and we've been seeing the biblical argument and we're saying, okay, okay, okay. How can I receive this experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, friends, I want to invite us to prepare our hearts to receive. That we would, we would kind of prepare our hearts to, to put ourselves in a position where God could do in our lives what He wants us to do. So let me give you a couple of thoughts. The first thought I want to share with you is actually a quote from the author of our article. And he said, uh, your personal experience— may differ from other people. This is such an important truth to know that, that not everyone is going to experience this experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in the exact same way that everybody else experiences it. Excuse me. In other words, in other words that some people, when they come into contact with the Holy Spirit, they will lose strength in their body and they can't stand and they may just fall on the floor as they experience the Holy Spirit. Other people, when they come into contact with the power of God, they may just begin to weep or even to, to, to tremble, just overwhelmed by God's love and by his nearness. Then there are times when some people, they will come into contact with God's Spirit and they will laugh uncontrollably with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And, and then there's other people, man, they will come into contact with God's presence and they won't be able to speak and they won't be able to move because they are in such awe and wonder of the presence of God that they just, they just stop everything and they're still and they just receive from God. What I need you to know, friends, is that, that we will all differ in the way that, we, that it kind of comes about for us. But the biblical models is what we want to look for. We want to look for what are the biblical evidences and the biblical signs. And so let's talk about this. How can we prepare our hearts to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Number one, I want to challenge you to get your heart right with God. The very first thing that any of us should do whenever we come to God is we just need to get our heart right before God because this world has a way of, of uh, you know, testing us and putting us through trials. And sometimes if we're not careful, we will allow some stuff to get in our heart. We will allow some toxicity to get into our hearts to where maybe we uh, have bitterness in our heart or we have resentment. Maybe we have uh, some some doubts, some fears, or some anxieties about the experience. Sometimes uh, we will have, uh, you know, unforgiveness in our heart where there are people in our lives where we just, you know, have ought against and we have not forgiven them. 
and our hearts are just not ready to interact with the Holy Spirit. And I want to just challenge you with the idea that God wants us to get our heart right. You know, when I first began to seek the baptism of the, the, baptism of the Holy Spirit, I actually did not receive right away. Uh, it was actually a several month process for me. And, uh, and, and while I, I'm not going to say that, you know, I, I could possibly do anything to earn or merit, you know, this experience, I will say that what God wanted to do in me was more important than even this ex experience that he wanted me to have. He wanted me to go on a journey where I begin to trust him more, where I begin to surrender more of my heart to him, to where I was no longer looking for just an experience, but where I was looking for God himself, just to give more and more of my life to him. And somewhere along in that journey, I, I really got to a place where I wasn't just trying to test God and say, okay, God, if it's real, you know, do it in me. I got to a place in my journey where I was being able to say, God, really, uh, you know, I don't even care about having an experience anymore. I just want you. Whatever it is you want in my life, Lord, I want to surrender to you. And I think that's really what God is looking for in all of our lives. He's looking for us to come to a place of trust. He's, come, he's looking for us to come to a place of surrender. He's, he's, he's looking for us to come to a place where we're saying, God, we just want you. So I would challenge you, number one, to get your heart right with God. Number two, I would say that we need to ask in faith. We need to come expecting to receive. We need to come believing that this is something that is a gift and a promise. And it's something God wants us to have. Everything, every promise that we will receive in this life as Christ's followers will happen because we act on faith. Not just a blind faith, but a faith that says, God, I believe what you say is true. And so God, I'm putting my trust in you, and I'm putting my trust in your word. And so according to your word, I am expecting to receive what you have spoken. And that, my friends, is what it means to ask in faith. Not just kind of, you know, straining to believe and trying to like squeeze out the doubt. You know, I think we sometimes come to a place and we're like, oh, I believe. And we're, we're just trying to, I don't know, you know, focus intensely. We're like, oh, you know, trying to muster up our faith. And we're, oh, trying to squeeze something out, you know. And you might squeeze something out, but, you know, but that's not faith. And uh, what we need to do is we need to, we need to relax a little bit and just go, God, I trust you. I trust your timing. I trust your will. I trust your ways and ask in faith. And then number three, uh, as you prepare your heart to receive, I want to just invite you, you know, be prepared because, you know, some physical things may happen. You know, you may be overwhelmed where you lose your strength or where you cry or where you laugh or where you shake. And I just want you to know, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of anything that God has for you because anything that God has for you is good. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, you ought, to, you ought to just say that right out loud. Whatever God has for me is for my good. Whatever God has for me is good. And so just be prepared and be okay with that. I, I think that sometimes what happens is that... Um, because of whatever insecurities we have or because of whatever uh, mental objections we have, we think to ourselves, well, you know, I wouldn't want to do anything undignified. You know, I wouldn't want anybody looking at me and, and uh, thinking I was odd or weird or whatever. And, and I'm not saying that you need to be weird. And I'm surely you're not saying that you need to do anything odd or try to drum up some emotion. But I am saying... Don't worry about dignity. Don't worry about your pride. Pride gets in the way of a lot of stuff God wants to do in our lives. Just be prepared to say, God, I know that whatever you have for me, it's good. And I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever you have. Our author in the Fire Bible, the, the, author, the article writer, he, he says it this way. He says, you know, even though some physical things may happen, do not try to manipulate the situation by stirring up your emotions. I, I think that this is a, a common temptation for a lot of well-meaning Christians that we, that we think, okay, you know, uh, because it can be a very emotional experience, you know, I have to work up my emotions. Our author says, don't do that. Don't, don't manipulate the situation by stirring up your emotions. He says, well-meaning Christians may, you know, if they're praying with you, they may pray louder, 
they may get more expressive, wave their hands, tell you to hold on or to let go or, you know, all these different things that well-meaning Christians try to do to try to prompt you uh, in some way. But and I, and I love that the author makes this point in his article because I think it's 100% true. God does not, not work that way. It's not about stirring up an emotional experience. And our author says, do not seek an experience, rather desire more of Christ. And I think that sometimes it will be an emotional experience, but but we shouldn't try to manipulate the situation by becoming emotional, thinking that that's how God works. We just need to receive. And number four, cooperate. Cooperate. We're getting our heart right. We're preparing our heart. We're uh, not manipulating our emotions. We're ready, though, for anything that might might happen. But then just simply cooperate because receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a choice. In the end, you will make a decision with your will to receive this experience and begin to speak in that unlearned language, this prayer language that we call speaking in tongues. Our author says this in his notes, and I thought this was brilliant. He said, some people never receive, they never have this experience with this physical sign, this physical evidence of speaking in tongues because they are waiting for some kind of uncontrollable experience, you know, that they just are passive spectator in the occurrence that, that uh, you know, uh, okay, God, here I am. If you're going to do something, hit me, <laughs> you know, just this uncontrollable experience. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, does not overpower a person's will you must actively cooperate. As a matter of fact, I think it's really important for me to just point something out right here, that when it comes to what God wants to do in our lives, he is always a perfect gentleman. He is always interested in a cooperation between human beings and, and his, his self. He, he wants us to be partners, willing partners in this divine dance that we call Christianity. Can I tell you which spirit it is that wants to take over you and cause you to do things uncontrollably? Probably, that would be evil spirits. It's the evil spirits that would want to cause you to do things that you can't help but do and force you to speak or force you to act in ways. Uh, that's th- Those are evil spirits. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. As a matter of fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Apostle Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and he's trying to say, hey, listen, I need you to cooperate so that everything is done in a godly manner. And as he's teaching on these gifts, uh, some of the people are acting like, well, I just can't help it. I just can't help it. The Holy Spirit comes on me and I can't help it. You know, I just do what I do and, and you know, and too bad, too bad. That's the way it is. I can't help myself when the Holy Spirit comes on me. And the Apostle Paul says, nope. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. That's you. That's you being weird. Stop being weird because the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. Let's look at it in the Bible. In the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32 and 33, says that the spirits of the prophets, these people that were prophesying through the Holy Spirit, are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of Peace. Let me explain what the scripture is saying here. Now, I'll, I want you to notice that in our English translation, the, the translators, the biblical scholars that translated said that the spirits of the prophets. And so what he's saying is that our human spirits, not the Holy Spirit, but our spirits inside of us uh, are subject to the prophets. And what is that saying? We're in control of our spirits. And so pa- the apostle Paul is saying, yes. You can control yourself. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and begins to interact with your spirit, you then have a choice. And and he goes on to explain. So when you feel like you have a word, hold on to it and then, you know, let two or three speak. And then the others are going to judge and determine whether or not that really was from God. And, and, And so it's the same thing when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. This will not be some uncontrollable experience because our spirits are subject to us. We make volitional choices uh, when the Holy Spirit interacts with us of how we will respond. And so let me wrap up tonight 
by sharing a couple thoughts about how we then will receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. How can we cooperate then? How do we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and not be a passive spectator, but actively cooperate and enter into this divine dance of experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Number one, uh, our article teaches us we should just relax. Again, not stirring up our emotions, not trying to manipulate the situation, but just getting before God and realizing it, that we are not going to create this experience, that this experience does not define God's love or acceptance of us, that it's simply a gift that God wants us to receive. If I was going to bring a gift to you, a wonderful gift, whatever that gift was, you don't have to get all uptight about that gift. All you have to do is receive. And that's what God wants us to do, is to receive. Uh, the second thing that our author recommends is that we worship God. That in this time that we are waiting to receive this experience, that we would just, just take that time and say, God, uh, I love you. And God, all I want is you. And God, I want to be in your presence. And, and just begin to put your mind in a place where your spirit begins to recognize that God is right there with you, that his presence is with you, and that he wants to give you his gift of the Holy Spirit. And just begin to worship him for that. Begin to thank him and express in your own words and in your own language, worship and love for God. That's, that's probably one of the most important things that you could ever do in really any prayer request that you ever bring before God is just worship him. And then, number three, as you worship him, seek the giver and not simply the gift. I think too often, uh, many, you know, sincere seekers, you know, they've heard about the tongues part or they've heard about the power part. And so they either want access to this supernatural power or they want to have this supernatural prayer language. And so they're, they're, they're saying, come on, God, give it to me. <laughs> you know, God, let me have a prayer language or God, give me the power. And, um, and God's saying, hey, um, come and seek me, because when we find God, we find all the power we need. When we find God, the, the fruit of that experience will be prayer languages and spiritual gifts and, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit in ways we could never even begin to imagine if we will just put our focus on God. And so that's probably the most important thing you can do is just relax, think about God, and then just worship Him, wanting him, not just his hand, but his heart, not just seeking what he can give, but seeking his face. And then number four, as you are in this posture of prayer and relaxing in worship, uh, our author says, then it's time to go ahead and begin to speak that unlearned language. As we talked about last week, whether that's a heavenly language or, or an unlearned earthly language, whatever it is, just go ahead and speak it. Begin to verbalize it. Begin to give voice. Begin to, to, to use your vocal cords and, and use the, uh, the, the language ability that God gave you just to begin to go ahead and speak this unlearned language. In the book of Acts, it gives us a little insight as to what happened. I, I chose to use the New American Standard Bible translation to kind of illustrate this point because of how the New American Standard translate this one particular word. But I want you to see the Bible says in Acts 2, 4, when this happened for the first group of believers. And remember, they had no idea what to expect. Nobody had ever had this particular experience before in history. And so what happened? It says that, and they, who's they? The believers that were receiving, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, um, I inserted the word they. That's why I put it in brackets. I inserted that word. The, the scripture says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. But, but who? Who began to speak? Well, we understand in English, they. They, they, the people that were uh, receiving, being filled, they began. Who began? They began. They began to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak. Not the Holy Spirit began to speak. They began to speak with other tongues. Watch this. As, they weren't just making something up. It wasn't just an emotional experience. As the Spirit was giving them utterance. Come on, everybody say utterance 
utterance. That's why I wanted to use the New American Standard Bible translation because of this word utterance. This word utterance in its original Greek language doesn't mean to simply speak what's on your mind. It doesn't, it's not used in the common language as, as just having a conversation, but it actually means, get this, it means having a dignified or elevated conversation. And so literally, the, uh, the, the biblical writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in their original Greek languages as they were writing and they were trying to describe what this experience was like, they said that they, as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke with these tongues as the Spirit was elevating the conversation, as he was elevating their language and giving them a language that was not just a commonplace language, but was this elevated, supernatural, dignified language. And, and that's exactly what the Holy Spirit will do for you as you begin to invite him to fill you with the Holy Spirit as you're relaxing, as you're worshiping God and seeking the giver and not just the gift and beginning to cooperate is the Holy Spirit will begin to drop syllables and words into your mind that may not make sense. And at that moment, you have a choice. Okay, am I going to speak those syllables and utter those utterances or am I going to wait for God to take control of my tongue and begin to move it around and begin to flow, you know, wind through my vocal cords so that, so that he is speaking through me? That's not how God works. God is saying, I want to cooperate. I'm going to give you the utterance. You begin to speak it. The author of the Fire Bible article writes these words. He says, as you, as you, uh, <laughs> I mistyped. It's supposed to be as you. As you worship and wait, unknown words or syllables may come to your mind. At some point, when that begins to happen, at some point, you must stop speaking in your own language and start praising in that spiritual language, this prayer language in tongues. The Holy Spirit will bring words and syllables to your mind, but you, come on, everybody say me. <laughs> you, you must do the speaking. And so I want to just tell you that when it begins to happen, you, you right there will have a, a choice at that moment. And you will either begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, or you will just hold on to it and wonder, is that me? Is that just me? Um, can I just tell you something? Yes, it's you. <laughs> Right? We just read it in the Bible. It's you that's going to be speaking. Some people will say, well, I don't want it to be me. It's going to be you. You cooperating with the Holy Spirit. So, so don't worry about that. As the Holy Spirit gives utterance, you, it is going to be you, are going to begin speaking. So our author gives us the next thought, and that is, so go ahead and speak even if it doesn't sound like a language. The only reason it doesn't sound like a language to you is because you haven't learned it. You've never heard this language before. Again, whether it's a heavenly language or if it's a, an earthly language, either present or past on the earth, either way, you don't know it. So it doesn't sound like a language to you. Whatever it sounds like, whatever those syllables, words are that, that the Holy Spirit gives you that utterance, just go ahead and begin to verbalize it. He goes on to say this. He says, speak even if it's only a few syllables. This was actually my experience. And so I'm like, how did the author of the Fire Bible know that? <laughs> well, I guess it's more commonplace than I would think. But when I first began to receive utterance, it did not, it did not sound like anything to me. And, and, you know, people are praying for me and they're saying, you know, uh, God's doing something. He's giving you utterance. Go ahead and speak it out. And I'm like, I, but I don't think that sounds like a language. And I, it's, it's really like this is only a couple of syllables, you know, maybe one or two, really probably just one. And, um, and but you know what happened is I, I just went ahead and began to cooperate and I began to speak that syllable. And, and, and as it came out, it felt awkward to do it. But the more I just begin to, to speak what I felt like God was giving to me, then I don't know how to explain it. I don't, I don't know how to explain it other than that, that one or two syllables begin to turn into a, a flow of syllables. It began to turn into kind of a, a stream of syllables and, and I guess perhaps words in the Spirit, this elevated language that the Holy Spirit was giving to me. And, and that's how it happens for so many people that as we die to ourselves and surrender our pride and begin to speak something we don't understand as the Spirit gives us the utterance, there becomes this flow. And let me finish with this thought. Number seven. 
And, and that is that I would encourage you to trust, at that point, trust that you are getting what you ask for. I know that this is the point that people begin to wonder, is it me? You know, was, did, I, did I really have an experience with God or was that just me? Again, I, I want to remind you, it was you. You were having an experience with God. He was giving you the utterance through the Holy Spirit and you began to speak. And, and at this point, faith, faith, trust, trust that God gave you what you asked him to give you. I want to share a verse of scripture with you, a passage of scripture with you that I think illustrates this in such an important way. So in the book of Luke chapter 11, I'm going to start in verse number nine. And this is a part of scripture that, that sometimes we quote, but we don't always quote it all the way in context. And so watch with me what's happening here. So this is Jesus speaking and he's speaking to you and I as followers. And he says, so I say to you, Jesus says, I, Jesus, the savior, say to you, my follower, my disciple, ask and it, what, will be given to you. This is, this is a part of how the kingdom of God operates. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Not you might, not, you know, if I'm having a good day, not, you know, if God's having, you know, a good day. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Here's the problem. Sometimes we just stop right there and we think, well, I don't know if it's working for me. Well, you got to read it all in context. He goes on to say, for everyone who asks, receives, you're going to receive. Sometimes it's not exactly what you think you should receive, but you're going to receive. And to the one who seeks, they find. Again, not always what you thought you set out on the journey to find, but you're going to find what God wants you to find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Again, maybe not the door you wanted, maybe not the door I wanted, but there will be a door opening to you. Then Jesus makes this, 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 this statement. And remember, this is connected, asking, seeking, knocking. It's connected to the statement. Which of you fathers, he asks, he speaks to the men. He says, which of you fathers, if your son, your beloved son, the one who's carrying on your name, the one that you would sacrifice anything for, if your son asks for a fish, and this is going to represent something that's good for you, something that, that provides nutrition, that provides health, that provides strength, if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. And of course, in this case, a snake represents, represents something bad for him, something that could harm the son. And he's saying, you know, you're a father, your, your son asks you for something good. You, as a father, is not going to give your son something that's going to harm him. And furthermore, we know that in the Bible that, you know, snakes are oftentimes used as a symbol of something evil. I know that there are some people that say, oh, that speaking in tongues, it's really the devil. Uh, <laughs> let's read the scripture. Which of you, fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, same thing, he's repeating himself, something good for you, will give him a scorpion, something that will harm you. Again, a representation of evil. Sometimes there are people out there who we're not sure, did I, did I receive? And I'm saying, hey, have faith that if you ask God for this experience and you begin to give utterance or you, you gave voice to the utterance that the Holy Spirit gives you, trust that God actually gave you this experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because if you're asking for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. And if you're asking for an egg, he's not going to give you a scorpion. He goes on to say this, if you then, you fathers, you earthly fathers, Though you are evil, again, without Christ and, you know, compared to God, you know, we're evil. Know how to give good gifts to your children. Watch this. Jesus says, how much more if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our kids that we love and we would do anything for to help them and bless them and not hurt them. If we know how to treat our children right, how much more, Jesus says, how much more will your Father in heaven the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loves us so much that he gave Jesus so that we could have life. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We need to trust and we need to believe that when we ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit and in that place of worship and, and resting in God's promises and receiving from God and, and in those moments that we think, wow, what are, 
these syllables and words that are filling my head that make no sense or sounds or groanings that, 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 that make no sense to me as I begin to speak them out. We have to understand that if we ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit, go ahead and according to this passage of Scripture and believe that God gave it to you. He would not give you something evil. He would not give you something that would harm you. He would give you what He promised, His very own Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's, let's pray and let's, let's invite God. Let's invite God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Come on, would you pray with me? Just open your heart right now and just relax right where you're at, in your, in your room, in your living room, or in your, at your work, or if you're in your car. And just pause and open up your heart to Jesus. Open up your heart to your Heavenly Father who loves you and wants to baptize you in His Spirit. Open up your heart to receive right now. And then just begin to worship Him. Worship Him. Tell Him you love Him. Tell Him what He means to you. Tell God how great He is and how thankful you are for all of His blessings in your life. And as you love God by verbalizing in English your words and your, your adoration, and as you, as you verbalize your commitment and devotion to Him, just, just focus on Him, the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then don't worry about the power. Don't worry about the tongues. Just focus on Him. And just decide, God, I want to give you my whole heart. I want you to have all of me. And just, just surrender. Open wide the door of your heart that the King of glory could enter in. And just focus on the giver and, and not simply the gift. And worship Him. And love Him. And as you give vocalization to your earthly praise, to your, your English praise, your, your, your learned language, as you vocalize that, open up your heart to the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit begins to give you utterance, step out in faith. Go ahead. Step out in faith even now and begin to give vocalization, verbalization to those syllables, those sounds, those groanings, those utterance. Go ahead. You sense the Holy Spirit begin to speak those syllables and those words. Begin to let the flow of the Holy Spirit, this prayer language, this speaking in tongues, this sign, go ahead. Just let it flow. And as it flows, know, know right now by faith you are receiving you are receiving the gift and the promise of the Father. Come on, just go ahead and pray. Worship. Worship in those tongues. Worship the Lord. Seek His face and let those tongues flow out of you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe people are being baptized right now. Right now. You're being filled with the Holy Spirit. Right now. God, His Holy Spirit is filling you to overflowing, a river of living water that is welling up within you. And go ahead, listen for that still, small voice of the Spirit beginning to give you those utterances. And it's going to be you. So go ahead, speak it out, and let that river flow. Just let it flow. Hallelujah. 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 I believe right now, Men and women, boys and girls that are joining us online right now are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank God. Thank God. I want to know about it. I want to know about it. I want to encourage you. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Keep praising the Lord. Let that prayer language flow. But uh, when you get done, send me an email. Let me know that God has filled you with the Holy Spirit, given you this prayer language, and, and you've experienced this initial physical sign, this evidence of a prayer language speaking in tongues. Let us know. We want to we wanna celebrate with you. We want to rejoice with you. Amen. Come on, let's all just right now ask God to fill us afresh and anew. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we love you. Fill us. Fill us afresh and anew, O oh God. Let us sense your presence right now. Your power, your glory, your grace as we seek your face. 
as we lift up the name of Jesus, oh God. Give us the confidence that we need to be your witnesses. Give us the power that we need to be your witnesses. Give us your strength, oh God, that our lives may be transformed, oh God. That we may be changed into the image of Christ, oh God. That our souls would grow and grow, oh God, in grace as you fill us, oh God. And Lord God, may our testimony, the testimony of our changed lives, be a powerful witness to all we come in contact with. This power that has a purpose. Fill us, oh God. Fill us in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and end our time together tonight, but you just go ahead. You know, you don't need me. Just go ahead and spend some time with God. Pray in the Spirit. Build up your faith. And let's, and let's fulfill God's purposes for our lives. And let's participate in God's mission for the world. Amen. I love you so much. I'll see you either here in the building on Sunday at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. or we'll see you online for our live broadcast. Love you. Have a great, great evening and a great, great week.